you just do one one class one time a week? I do four or, times a week. Okay, so you do two that. hours each. So I did I did two hours today. Okay. Two hours today, learning how to um, solve fractional equations. I'm teaching them that. I'm teaching them how to do functions. If you know how to do functions, you know how to do functions, right, Sam? Sure. You hit the function button on the calculator. And I say, see, now here's the first thing I want you to appreciate about learning functions, see, is that functions are, and then I have functions written up on the board, and then I just erase all but the first three letters. <laughs> yeah, well, you use them a lot in calculus, and that's why I'm, I'm reviewing them. Because, see, I'm trying to, right now I'm trying to work out these hydrological equations where I can prove, basically, that you cannot possibly hold back a body of water, the volume that Lake Missoula was presumed to be, by a seal composed of glacial ice. You absolutely couldn't do it. It's impossible. The problem is, you know, it's sort of like the global warming thing. Once you acknowledge that the whole basis of the idea doesn't make sense, they've, got, they've erected this whole superstructure on the idea that anthropogenic warming is the sole cause of climate change, which of course there's many variables and many factors, and while the human contribu contribution is a, certainly a small factor, it is probably one of the most trivial factors compared to other things, like changing geometries of the of orbital geometries, changes in solar radiation, changes in the optical density of the atmosphere, changes in CO2 output from the oceans. I mean, we could start with a list going right down the line, and probably every one of those is more significant or no less significant than anthropogenic warming. But the idea of the flood out in, in the Pacific Northwest is similar, in, in that it's predicated upon a model that doesn't make sense. Because if you abandon that model, what you're stuck with is something much, much bigger than the conventional dogmas permit. The conventional dogmas have that here's this lake held in by this ice dam, and it's just a bigger version of what you can go up to Iceland and see, or go over to British Columbia and see, or go up to Alaska and see, where you have these diminutive small little lakes that might have a volume of less than a thousandth of Lake Missoula, and yet somehow they can effectively breach the glacial dam that's holding them in and create a, a locally catastrophic flood. So what they do is they assume, well, we'll just imagine that since we've seen a lake held in by some ice up in British Columbia or down even in the Andes or wherever, we'll just imagine that we can extrapolate up by three orders of magnitude, and that can explain the Missoula flood. But see, once you realize that it make, that, that it's total nonsense, then what are you left with? See, every other possible mechanism, Earth-based mechanism, has essentially been ruled out. And here's what Brett did. Brett spent 30 years building a, a case that was so ironclad that no matter what dogmas that the mainstream geologists invoked, they couldn't deal with this, you know, the 800-pound gorilla in the room was this, this evidence that Brett's had assembled. So what they finally did in order to somehow make that fit into their dogmas is they took this 800-pound gorilla and they dressed it up in this nice little, you know, pinky Lee suit and put a little cap on them and tried to make them look acceptable. But it's still a big 800-pound gorilla. And, and the problem is, see, is when you realize that, that that scenario that they've contrived makes absolutely no sense, then, then what do you do? Now you're stuck with this gigantic flood with, with peak flows of hundreds of millions, even billions of cubic feet per second, and, and absolutely no explanation. And see, the problem is they've gone halfway. By the 1960s, they had gone and acknowledged that, yes, there was a big flood. And here's how we explain it. So they can't backtrack on the flood now. The flood happened. Anybody can go out there and traverse this landscape for themselves, and they'll soon find out that, yep, they'll soon begin to get the eyes to see and understand, yes, I can see now what happens when a thousand-foot tidal wave moves across the landscape. It can gouge out a channel 800 to 1,000 feet deep in a matter of, of days. It can strip away every single thing 
that existed there before it came, so that there's nothing left. Well, anybody can see the effects. The effects, once you, once you begin to learn how to read the effects, they're indisputable. The problem is, is going from, okay, a recognition and an acknowledgement of the reality of these, of floods of this scale, to some kind of an explanation that makes sense. And like I've said repeatedly in, in these discussions we've been having over the last couple of years, the only thing that makes sense, well, there's nothing that makes sense unless your explanation, if your explanations are confined to purely terrestrial sources. But as soon as we expand our consciousness to include the cosmic domain, yes, very, very plausibly, the cosmos has the kinds of energy or force inputs into the system that could result in that kind of an event. Because see, basically, what they, what they know, whether they admit it or not, is that they abandon the ice dam theory and thereby abandon a local explanation. They're suddenly confronted with something that in reality is global in scope and not local. But the current theory keeps it local. It keeps it in that box. So I'm out to demolish that theory. I'm out to show that, yeah, this Earth does get assaulted by cosmic forces, and it does it on a fairly regular basis, and it's done it repeatedly through the history of the Earth. And if we want to have a future, that is what we better be reckoning with. To hell with a point zero 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 eight percent CO2 increase from you know, car, uh, industrial emissions. That's not that's not what we're worried about. I have a suggestion for you on your there's their basic assumption is scale and variance. Yeah. So uh, take the Iceland example and scale it up and see if it would actually fit in the Missoula area. Well, the thing about the Iceland example is, and if you look at the Iceland example, it actually refutes the Missoula flood example. Well, that's what I'm getting at. I, I, I brought this question up to one of the help ge geologist helpers on this field trip that, that me and Brad went on last summer out there. You know, we, when we went out there in August, we, we signed up for a field trip sponsored by the Ice Age Floods Institute and uh, led by three geologists, all who had done work or written papers or done some, some work on, on the, the flood effects out there. The leader of it has written a, actually a very beautiful book on it. You could show what scale of variance, well, whether it would work. <clears throat> now, we had a, I had a brief discussion with a number of these people about stuff. Um, one of the things is when I mentioned the fact of the, the, the difficulty of having glacial ice hold back that much water, uh, one of the assistant's responses to me was, well, you got to bear in mind that the, that the ice dam was 30 miles thick. And you're like, oh, oh, well, you've got me on that one. Well, if you look in Iceland, and I don't know how to pronounce the Icelandic term for the, for the name of the volcano, but there is a large ice sheet. In fact, I'm putting this into my updated program I'm putting together solely on climate change. There is a large glacier up there with a volcano under it. That volcano just so happens to be 30 miles from the perimeter of the ice sheet. Now, that volcano, about every 20 or 30 years, it erupts. Okay, when it erupts, it creates a subglacial reservoir of meltwater. The volume of that meltwater is, constitutes some of the biggest outburst floods documented in the modern record. That flood is the one that I've used to get, when I mentioned earlier, three orders of magnitude. In other words, the largest known modern outburst flood that's been documented was less than a thousandth of the volume flowing out of the <coughs> Lake Missoula area. That was this, these, they're called Jokalaups, Icelandic term for outburst flood. So you got this volcanic eruption that occurs under the ice, it melts this reservoir of water. The, re the size of the, the reservoir of water, again, is less than a thousandth that of Lake Missoula. And it takes approximately two to three weeks for that volume of water to migrate through the 30 miles of ice, separating it from the perimeter, and then it bursts out and creates this Yokolops or outburst flood. Now, what that shows me is that even a 
very small volume of water under a very small pressure can quickly move through glacial ice. Now, the scale invariant part, when you're talking about, Jerry, scaling up from that, well, here, here's the problem. You've got a picture. Everybody knows how you've got concrete reinforced dams. Charles, you probably know something about it. Concrete reinforced steel, very thick at the base. Uh, steel uh, pins going into the bedrock. Bedrock grouting, you know what the purpose of bedrock grouting is? What that means? No, bedrock grouting, you know what it is, right, Sam? When you inject grout, a slurry, a cement slurry into the bedrock to fill up every pore in the bedrock, creating a curtain, what's called a grout curtain, under the dam. It keeps water from going through it. Right, and because you can't, have, you can't have the slightest trickle going through. That's right. Because what will happen is it'll, that slight trickle will slowly enlarge the conduit until it reaches some critical threshold. Once it's breached that critical threshold, the water flowing through there begins to quickly erode away the walls of the conduit. Wow. Okay, now, you picture, we've got... <laughs> We've got this dam of glacial ice. Now picture you've got a valley. It's got a flat floor that's two miles across, and the bottom of that floor is unconsolidated sediment several thousand feet thick. Not rock, sediment. Then the valley comes up mountainsides on both sides, and at 2,100 feet up off the valley floor, the valley is seven miles wide. So picture it seven miles wide, at 2,100 feet up from the valley floor, comes down into the bottom at the flat valley floor, it's two miles wide. Now think about the, what's the biggest dam in North America, concrete reinforced dam, the most massive. Grand Coulee, it's one mile wide, 400 feet high, say 400 feet high, one mile wide. What? not bigger. Hoover's taller, but it's, Hoover is over 700 feet high. Okay. And again, Hoover, like Grand Coulee, is anchored directly into the bedrock itself. Okay. Now you've got Hoover, the tallest dam in the U.S., holds back a pressure head of maybe 600 feet of water, maybe a little more. And they don't fill it up the reservoir all the way up to the top of the dam. Grand Coulee is 400 feet high, and its pressure head of water is going to be less than that, 300 and something feet. Carter Dam is 400 feet deep. Which one? Carter. Carter Dam, just north of here. Four, 400 feet deep. Deep is 110. But my, my point is, is when we see a, a, an, con, an engineered concrete steel reinforced dam, 700 feet of Hoover Dam, I believe, is the tallest dam in the U.S., okay, which probably has the highest pressure behind it because of the depth. And Grand Coulee is, you know, a mile wide. Okay. So now compare the size of Grand Coulee to this valley, the profile I'm talking about. We're seven miles <coughs> wide. Now when I say 2,100 feet, the reason I say 2,100 feet is because that's where the high water mark is. In, inside the reservoir, the high water mark is 2,100 feet above the valley floor. So you've got to create a, a completely impermeable seal. That's 1,000 PSI pressure. For that's right. It's al almost 1,000 PSI at, at the bottom. So if it was going to burst, it would start at the bottom first. It would start at the bottom. But you see, you have to bear in mind now, glacial ice is not a solid impermeable mass. You, you go and read about the, the anatomy of glaciers, what you'll discover is they've got crevices, they've got fractures all through them, they've got tunnels with water flow, they've got rivers that flow through them. There's intercrystalline <coughs> water flow that flows through the, the crystals of ice. Now. If you look at modern glacial dams, what you find out is that there's no example of a modern glacial dam that has held back water more than two to 300 feet tops. Most of them fail when the water gets to be about 100 feet deep, 150 feet deep. But out there in Montana, what they're saying is that there was a glacial dam that held back 2,100 feet of water across this valley with a seven foot span at the at the water level. Seven miles. Seven mile span, a seven mile span. <laughs> now how plausible is that? And it did it fifty times? And it's a, it's a supposedly, well according to the latest theories, it has it did that up to eighty times. 
So if the dam gives way, the water all drains out, all 550 cubic miles of water drains out of these mountain valleys, and then somehow the ice comes back out of Canada, reseals the valley, refills this lake with another 500 cubic miles of water. Now meanwhile, while all this is going on 50 or 60 or 80 times, all the rest of the ice complex in North America is disappearing and melting back. But some, it, it, diminishing in height, it's diminishing, its margin is going back. So, but somehow, out there in this area of northern Idaho and western Montana, the ice is able to come back and keep resealing this valley so that you can repeatedly have these floods. But you can see, what, what it reminds me of is if you read about the old Ptolemaic model of the solar system. Remember what the Ptolemaic model was. In, in Ptolemy's model, the Earth was at the center. And as long as your observations weren't too precise, you could almost believe it. And for, you know, a thousand years or more, the Ptolemaic model of the solar system was considered sacrosanct. Earth was at the center, the sun went around the Earth. What happens then is that eventually Kepler and Tycho Brahe and Galileo come along, Copernicus, present the data that totally refutes it. But what happened was it's in the interim, as the observational science got better, they would go out and they would go, wait a second, okay, if it's perfectly circular, see in the Ptolemaic model, Earth is at the center and everything else is in perfect circles. In the real model, Sun is at the center and the orbits are elliptical. So the problem was is with the improvements in observation, there become more and more discrepancies between the theoretical model and the real world observations. So in order to explain those real world observations, what they would do is they would introduce efferents and cycles and epicycles within the greater until finally it became so complicated with these cycles within cycles within cycles that Mars was coming up and then it was doing this and then it was doing that and it got so complicated that almost nobody could understand it anymore. And then of course here comes Kepler along and what he does is he does some <coughs> elegant mathematical calculations that shows that the observations doesn't fit Earth at center with circular orbits, it fits Sun at center with elliptical orbits. And all of this complexity just basically disappears with just a new theoretical approach. Well, all the theorizing about the Missoula flood is sort of like that Ptolemaic, see, because one flood couldn't explain the, the vast complexity of this phenomena that's preserved out there. So then they had to go to two floods, and then five floods, and then seven floods, and then 40 floods, and now it's up to 80 floods. Because the, the, the effects of it are on such a vast scale that there's no way they can say, okay, all that water came out of this one outlet of this lake, and it caused all of this stuff. Well, it, could, it was impossible to have that only happen once, so what they've done is they've kept adding and adding and adding to where now it's like 80 floods required to do it. Well, like Ptolemy's theory of the solar system, it's just gotten to the point where it's so unwieldy, it's time to just replace it with a much more elegant theory. It's an elliptical flood. Yes, the theory is that, um, <laughs> see, and all of the critics of Brett's all rejected his idea of a flood because they said, well, there's no force, we don't know of any force, there's no volcanoes up there, we don't, there's no forces that could cause the kind of See, because Brett's originally invoked glacial melting. And that's what he attributed to, to for 20 years. Before, between the early 1920s and the 1940s, Brett's, in all of his papers, attributed to some accelerated glacial melting. Then Pardee comes along in the 40s and says, oh, there was this big lake in western Montana. It drained out. Now geologists who had rejected, who wouldn't even consider, wouldn't even go look at the evidence that Bretz was documenting in the field, said, hmm, a glacial lake. Well, there are modern glacial lakes. Ah, this fits the criterion of uniformitarianism. The present is the key to the past, and this is the cornerstone of our geological religion, is that we only can interpret things from the past according to things we see going on right now. And if it's not going on right now, it never happened. That was, that was the prevailing dogma for a hundred years. 
Well, Bretz's ideas went so completely counter to that, but with the introduction of the idea of a glacially dammed lake, the uniformitarians could now go, oh, well, okay, it's just a bigger version of something that we see going on in the world today. Case settled. No mystery anymore. And that's essentially where it stands. But I can already see the breaches. The dam is beginning to crack. The water is starting to come out of these cracks and it's gaining force. And I'm going to go up there with a little stick of dynamite and see if I can't accelerate the process. Well, yeah, I mean, I've had, I have no doubt that, you know, people are catching up to where I was five and ten years ago. Yeah, I have no doubt of that. Better get that book out. Really? I know it. Get on with it, buddy. Okay, well, let's get on. Paul is going, wish this guy would get onto the Mayans. <laughs> well, see, the thing is, of course, is that the Mayans have some major pieces of the puzzle for us. Yes, Don? Is this <clears throat> all leading to you having a theory or a model that would explain all this stuff? Yeah. Good. Right. I mean, essentially what we're doing here is we're looking at, this is sort of like, forensic detective work. We're examining a whole slew of these different clues trying to put together and reconstruct a crime. We're reconstructing a crime scene. The problem is here the crime scene is the whole god darn planet. <laughs> However, there are certain places where the clues are preserved in greater abundance than other places. So we focus in on those areas. The Mayans, which we, we've been talking about last, last time and this time too, we're going to talk about some here now. Have, were custodians of a whole body of very important clues in their traditions. The Mayans knew all about cosmic catastrophes and, and the consequences of cosmic catastrophes. And if you read about their mythology, I mean, just like the Greeks, they talk about the world being destroyed four times. The Greeks talk about the world being destroyed four times. Sometimes these destructions involve fire, sometimes they involve water. But these are the two principal agents by which the world is periodically destroyed. The same with the Hopis. And the same with the Hopis. That's exactly right. Yes, the same with the Hopis. So I believe that we can learn a lot by going to the various traditions of old and the in traditions of indigenous peoples around the world. And I see those traditions as being perfectly complementary with the modern scientific traditions from astronomy and geology and geophysics and so forth. Sam. Okay. What Sam was talking about there was essentially a worldwide collapse of cultures. It was 4,200 years ago. Between 42 and 4,500 years ago it was the collapse of the Bronze Age cultures. <laughs> and you had Minoans biting the dust, you had Egyptians, you had civilizations in the, in the Western Hemisphere biting the dust. And again, I have not pursued that in depth, but clearly that would be something that would warrant. Okay. We talk, remember we talked about God K? How many of you remember God K? Jerry's the only he one? Is that the one that was the fallen God? That's a cigar smoker. Oh, yeah, that's okay. right. A little cigar smoker, okay. Can't remember their names. Well, let's back up just a little. <laughs> All right, this is a, a Venus sign, an Aztec Venus sign, but it's also got the fourfold division here, which signifies the four ages. These things right here. And this is the God eye right here. And what we see here is very interesting. It's an omega type sign. And we've encountered that omega sign somewhere else. Where? But give me one specific place we encountered. It was silver, wasn't it? Sumer, yes, ancient Sumeria. In ancient Sumeria, the Omega stood for what? In. Yes, it was their sign for comets, exactly. Now, how would you also compare that to the Eye of Horus? Well, I would say it could be a stylized counterpart to it. It may ultimately derive from the same meaning as what, the Eye of Horus. What is the ages of that one versus Horus? We don't have, I don't think there's any precise <coughs> chronologies to form a you know a one to one correlation. I mean it was as far as dates. The Eye of Horus was six thousand years ago and this one was 13. Oh, oh well this was at least one to two thousand years ago. Okay. One to two thousand. And 
right on down to the time the Europeans arrived. Um, I've forgotten the exact source of this. It shows up on a number of different codices and on monumental architecture, usually associated with Venus. And as you learn more about the specifics of the catastrophes, the details, you'll discover why Venus is associated so frequently with catastrophes. There's a reason, and it's a perfectly logical reason, and it's not what Velikovsky thought it was, because Venus itself was not the comet. That's what Velikovsky thought. And we'll briefly, we'll quickly go through the slides that we looked at already to show you in the Mayan tradition the, the falling gods and the different ways of representing the falling gods. And this is a very typical way. The legs folded back like this. And he's holding something in his hand. And always, whatever these gods are holding or wearing, if they're wearing, if they got something on their head, if they're wearing something, if they're holding something, it's usually significant. Notice this little feet sign right up here. There's the universal sign for the four ages of the world. Also the four cardinal directions, because in all of the ancient traditions, time was equated with space. So space, we had the four sacred directions, the circle on the ground with the, with the cross in it pointing to the, to the north, south, east, and west, but it was also a model of the, the wheel of time, representing the great year, the four ages of the world, the annual year with the four seasons, and so forth. So you find that, that little, the wheel there, the wheel of fortune, that's what that is, the wheel of fortune in the tarot card, the, the, the turning of the great year, associated with this fallen god. Now that's pretty important. And in, the, in these symbolical representations, again, what you have to look at is the unique and particular juxtaposition of symbols that's occurring. Because in the same way that arrangement of letters and words conveys certain meanings. <clears throat> Let me open another one real quick here. This was an example that I used. Meaningless letters, right? No, probably not. Probably not? Mm -hmm. Just random letters? What does that say there? Anything? Nothing. It's just... Now see, we all right at this point, since we all know English, we, we can all recognize these letters, but it doesn't convey any specific meaning. It's just letters. Does it spell revolution? A very, very good. Look like love routine to me. Well, we see what I'm doing here is okay, here's one word out of it. And now you take this word, you arrange the letters this way, and you get violent. Okay, now here's a word that invokes a specific response, a specific, you know, this isn't the same, uh, you know, feeling that you would get if the word said, uh, you know, pick something in contrast to violent. Sweet oh. Peace. Peace. What? Peace. what? Peace. 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 Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I've already done that one. But this was, what I did here was, uh, I did, uh, Say those are the same letters. <laughs> no, these are different letters. But uh, see what I what I did as I started out by I had them all rearranged like this, and then I started moving them around until finally somebody in the audience was the first <clears throat> one. Just like Dennis was the first one to see what the word was. The previously, I had them rearranged so that you couldn't tell. And then I started rearranging these letters, which are in effect symbols, right, until the meaning is lost. So the meaning is conveyed in the way that these particular symbols, is what these are, these are symbols, the way they're arranged determines the meaning that is conveyed. And, and, and that's the whole point I'm trying to make here, is that when you look at when you look at these symbols, you have to bear in mind that they are carefully arranged and carefully contrived as much as, you know, an author would sit down and carefully put together certain arrangements of words, you know, 
a, a, a famous author puts together the words to make certain sentences and puts together the sentences in certain ways. And if you take them apart and rearrange them, the meaning is lost. Yes, Don? So what is that thing above the, the diving god? The X's? This thing right here? With yeah, this? Yeah, yeah. What is that? Well, that has been referred to as the sky dragon glyph. And those are supposed to represent the scales of a dragon. And the thing from his waist to his, his heels? That I'm not sure of. What is the glyph that's on the, the bar below the, the circle of time? Well, this he is the builder's square. Okay, yeah, but there's a glyph right there. Where you're oh, on it? Yeah. Yeah, that's, um, I'm not sure what that is. And the thing that he's holding, the brown, the key. It's a key. What kind of key? You're... That's a thunderbolt. Yeah, the thunderbolt. Thank you. Thank you, Wade. That's what it is. Like a thunderbolt. You're not diving down to catch something. You got your hands out there to catch it. Maybe play football. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's what it is. But see, see, now you brought that up. You know, the Mayans were big ball players. Yeah. Yes, they were. But when the Mayans were playing ball, it was all symbolic. They weren't just out there moving around in the field. It was symbolical. And they, they definitely believed that the players on the field were associated with the movement of cosmic bodies. Of that, there's very little doubt. Even, even conventional scholars admit that. Okay, and here we have a ceremonial drinking cup. And we see a diving figure on it. And he's holding balls in his hand, which were probably balls of resin called copal that was used in rituals. And this is off the architrave over the door of a temple in Tulum. Very dis defaced. The rest of them, his head and arms were down here and they've been pretty much eroded away or vandalized. But here you can see the feet and the bent knees. And here's another depiction. Here you see the feet with the bent knees. At, at this, again, on the architrave, this horizontal band over the entryway to the temples. And there's a lot of other glyphs around here as well. But for now, just I want to call your attention to the diving figure that's over the door. Oops. From the Dresden Codex, one of the few Mayan codices that weren't destroyed by the Catholic bishops, has several diving figures in it. And diving dogs is one of them. Here's another representative. This is that same thing, that band, that represents the sky dragon. It's referred to by Mayanists, the, the sky dragon. And these represent the scales. It's a very geometricized symbol that represents the dragon. And here we have the dog with his tail wrapped around that sky glyph and his tail and his two forelimbs, he's holding these torches, burning torches. Notice the tongue there. Almost like a serpent's tongue rather than a dog's tongue. And we've met this fellow, <coughs> Zantamak, falling. Uh, whose fall to earth was recognized during the Festival of the Dead, which is the Halloween festival. And these are star glyphs. You see these things? These represent stars. And one of the early astronomically uh, educated Mayanists, Stansbury Hagar, interpreted these as being falling stars. And you'll notice when we go back to that vase, you see there, see here they are right here? Mm -hmm. Notice, those are the same things. And then we have the alchemical symbol for fire up here. In fact, it turns out that this equilateral triangle appears to have been used all over the ancient world as a symbol for fire. It still survives, you know, in, in astrological symbolism. That's, uh, that's unusual, it's a tatva also. It's what? A tatva. Oh, oh, yeah, one of the tatvas or tatvas. So how do you account for the, uh, the same correspondence? 
Well, you can you know, we're looking at either universal archetypes or a diffused, a diffusionist tradition that comes, you know, from some ultimate source. That, that, yeah. Okay, what else is on this figure here that we that I have not pointed out yet? That's the white that's falling. Yeah. Why is he falling? Yeah. Ah, well, there, my friend, is the rub. So we'll get to that. <laughs>